Maxwell House Coffee presents Good News of 1939. <laughs> Once again, the makers of Maxwell House Coffee welcome you to an hour of entertainment from the Metro Golden Mayor Studios in Hollywood. Our host for this evening is a young man who in the past two years has sprung from obscurity to a position where his face and voice are familiar to millions of men and women all over the world. Everybody's favorite picture star, Robert Taylor. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As most of you know, Los Angeles is playing host to the American Legion Convention this week, and we're glad to welcome some of their representatives to our program this evening. In the next 59 minutes or so, you'll hear from Fanny Bryce and Hanley Stafford, Maxie Rosenblum, that famous boxer, actor, and Boniface, Frank Morgan. Oh, Bob, Bob. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, what's the matter, Ted? Well, Morgan hasn't showed up yet. No, well, all no, other. don't worry. Frank will turn up all right. Frank Morgan, Meredith Wilson and his orchestra, and that popular radio and picture singer, Phil Regan. And one more special guest whom we're always glad to see, Miss Florence Rice. Say, Bob. Yes, Meredith. Well, Frank Morgan is late. He hasn't arrived. All right, so Morgan isn't here. What of it, Meredith? A fine trooper like Frank's bound to turn up when he's due to go on. Well, I hope you're right, Bob, but it's most unusual. Say, what's that racket? Well, it must be some legionnaires going by outside. They're coming in here. Yeah, but that's no legion band. It's Frank Morgan. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen... Believe it or not, here comes Senator Frank Morgan in a red, white, and blue silk hat with a 16th class land marching up the aisle of the studio. He's got students in the parade with signs and banners. Morgan for Senator. Frank Morgan, the people's choice. Now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of Morgan. Girls, too. Hold it, boys. <laughs> well, how do you like my parade, Bob? Frank, you can't do this. Well, don't be silly. This is a free country, and when I see a crowd as big as this, i got to go after some votes. Now, just go on play, boys, while I throw around a few handbills. Morgan for Central. Morgan for Central. Our ranking. He's a diamond in the rough. Very rough. Everything is on the top. On the top. With Morgan for Central. And he's a cad But compared to certain others He shouldn't be so bad Ladies and gentlemen Ladies and gentlemen We are here to have you meet this man Who is no bargain We are loath to introduce Mr. Franklin Drew Morgan My friend, I accept the nomination. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I am known as the man who calls a spade a spade. What do you call four spades? A pretty fair bid. And anything, <laughs> when I'm elected... Oh, vote for Frankie Morgan when you vote, when you vote. Vote for Frankie Morgan when you vote, when you vote. If you search the universe, you couldn't find much worse. So vote for Frankie Morgan when you vote. Well, thanks, boys. Any more questions, folks? Uh, Senator, if you're elected, yes. what do you intend to do about the youth movement? Uh, the youth, uh, youth uh, movement. Well, I'm uh, interested in young people, and I say to the parents of this great nation... Now is the time to take your 18-year-old daughters aside and have a heart-to-heart talk with them. And believe me, you'll learn plenty. <laughs> Play, boys! We'll have only fancy vittles. We'll have only fancy vittles. We'll have only fancy vittles if he wins. If he wins, we'll have caviar and pheasant and champagne to make it pleasant. And the pigs will have fried chicken in their beds. That's fine, boys. Play some more. No, no, got... no. Now, wait a minute, boys. You too, Frank. If you're going to take up time on this program of your campaign, I think you really ought to tell us where you stand on some of the major issues. Yeah. I'm sure your audience agrees with me. Yeah, let's hear his platform. Yeah. Well, I... Uh, you see, Frank, you see, you've got to start making sense. Well, very well, my boy. <laughs> I will tell you of my platform. I'll take it flank by flank. And I'll even sign a written guarantee. That I'm going to put a chicken in every single pot If you folks will only cast your vote for me Vote for Frankie Morgan If you all want some chicken fricassee I am going to pay a pension to every man and child If you folks will only cast your vote for me Almost all of my supporters are in the county jail, so by don't let those poor old dear old go free. I am going to put a pint of beer in all your dinner pails, if you folks will only cast your vote for me. Vote for Frankie, vote for Frankie, we will all go on the street. And I'll see to it myself that all the pretty girls get jobs, if you folks will only cast your vote for me. Cast a vote for Morgan, sound a note for Morgan. You don't have to sound those notes. Why? I bribed the man who counts the votes, so you might as well go cast your vote for me. You will get a thank So help me. If you cast your vote for Frankie. That's me. Morgan. The senator has gone out for a smoke, so we'll continue our good news with Florence Rice, Phil Regan. Say, hey, Bob, uh, I'd like to ask you a favor. Okay, Meredith, what is it now? Well, it's about Florence Rice. There's something happens to me every time I see her. I get a burning sensation in my throat. My head feels heavy. I feel dizzy all over. Have you ever had that feeling? Oh, yes, many times, Meredith. Well, what do you do for it? I take bicarbonate of soda. No, no. Please, Bob, I want to meet her. But uh, I get so nervous and excited around women, and I'm sure... Uh, you know, I... Well, I'd like to make an impression on Miss Rice. Well, Meredith, there's only three things that most women are interested in. So if you stick to those subjects, you're all right. Yes? Women are interested in home. Home, yes. Yes, they're all interested in the marriage question. Marriage, yes. And then since Miss Rice has such an illustrious father, it might be good to talk about a family. Family, yes. Uh, home, marriage, family. Home, marriage, family. Yeah, all, all right, Meredith. You go home. over the corner and make up a nice little conversation for yourself. I'll get Florence. Oh, fine. Home, marriage, family. Yes, uh, Florence. Home, marriage. Uh, Florence Rice. Yes, Bob, am I on? Well, not yet, really. We'll do your dramatic sketch a little later. But right now, Meredith Wilson, our band leader, is dying to meet you. Oh, I'll be delighted. Don't be too sure. Oh, Meredith. Uh, Meredith, Meredith. This, uh, Miss Rice, this is Mr. Meredith Wilson. How do you do, Mr. Wilson? Uh, let's go home, get married, and raise a family. What? Now, wait a minute, boy. Ah, you dope, Meredith. Now you fixed everything. Well, gee, I said what you told me. I'll get up on that bandstand. I'll have to straighten this out later. Our first guest on our Maxwell House program this evening is a young fellow you've heard on the radio and seen in pictures. It's a pleasure to have him with us, Phil Regan. Thank you, Bob. For his first number, Phil presents the popular new song, Where in the World? Oh, 
voice deep in my soul keeps saying, where in the world can my lover be? Where in this wonderful world is there someone for me? But tell me, how will we happen to me? Where in the world is that moment divine? Where are those arms? Where are those lips? Who is far? Will you be mine? Where you are with your life, a little rain must fall. But when Baby Snooks was born, it really poured. Here she is, Fanny Bryce, as that impossible rascal, Baby Snooks. <laughs> at this moment, Daddy, played by Henry Stafford, is returning after a hard day at the office. We hear him put the key in the lock of the front door. Door opens, and Daddy walks in. Phew, what a day. Mother, Mother, is anybody home? Snooks, what is it? Well, whose dress have you got on? It's Mommy. I've been playing house. <laughs> playing house? Uh-huh. And I just cleaned the stove. <laughs> oh, do you look cute. Your face is all smudged. And what's that filthy rag in your hand? <laughs> it's your new shirt. <laughs> well, what? You cleaned the stove with my new shirt? And I polished the floors with it, too. Oh, what's that... What's this red stuff all over the floor? I couldn't find any parts, so I used Mommy's glue. Oh, look at this place. My shirt's ruined, the floor's all wrecked, the whole house upset. And I've got you to thank for this. You're welcome, Daddy. Snooks, I ought to take you and... <laughs> oh, what are you laughing at? Because your neck that's all red. Never mind about that. And I don't want you laughing in my face when I'm scolding you, you understand? Uh-huh. <laughs> well, you did it again. I didn't mean it, Daddy. I was smiling... And a smile buster. Oh, what a mess this place is. How come your mother let you do it? Mommy ain't here. Oh, where is she? She went away with Uncle Louie. Uncle Louie? Uh-huh. And I took Aunt Sophie to the hospital. Oh, what for? They told me she had a headache. Oh, don't be silly. People don't go to the hospital for a headache. That's what I thought. <laughs> when they started spelling things. Oh, 
Oh, wait a minute. Did you say Aunt Sophie? Yes, Dad. Oh, that's different. I've got a telephone. What's the matter with her, Daddy? Oh, uh, nothing. Nothing at all. She's, uh, well, she's, uh, maybe she did have a pretty bad headache. Uh, Snooks, I'd better run down to the hospital. Why? Well, I'm, uh, uh, well, I'm going to take Aunt Sophie some aspirins for a headache. Ah. Uh. Daddy? Yes? You better take a rattle for the baby, too. What? <laughs> baby? Well, how do you know about the baby? Well, a telephone called up. Oh, really? What did they say? Aunt Sophie got a new baby. Oh, good. Did they just call up? Uh-huh. Was it a boy or a girl? It was Mommy. No, I mean... <laughs> oh, never mind. Say, this is marvelous. Sophie's got a baby. I'd better call her right away. You don't have to, Daddy. Oh, why not? I think she knows about it. Now, don't be careful. I wonder who it looks like. Oh, just think, Snooks, you've got a little cousin. Hello? Central Hospital? Mrs. L. Higgins, please. Well, Snooks, aren't you happy? No, I am. Oh, of course you are. You'll have a wonderful little playmate. Now, which would you rather have Aunt Sophie bring you? A boy cousin or a girl cousin? Don't it make no difference to Aunt Sophie? Well, of course not. I'll let her bring me a little yellow dog. Oh, stop. <laughs> oh. Hello? Oh, who is this? Oh, hello, Mother. Uh, how's Sophie? Oh, that's fine. A boy? Great. Who does he look like? Oh. Who does he look like, Daddy? Uncle Louie. Oh. <laughs> Are they going to keep him? Quiet. <laughs> huh? Uh, oh, what's that? Oh, he's got my eyes. Oh, fine. And Sophie's hair. And he's got Louie's nose. Hmm? Daddy. What? And he's got nothing of his own. Now, <laughs> Hello? Hello? Oh, okay, dear. I'll put Snooks to bed and come right down there as soon as I clean up. Goodbye. I want to go with you. Oh, you can't go, Snooks. Why? Well, because they don't allow children there. Well, how did Aunt Sophie get that one in? That's a different thing. The doctor brought that one. Why, my, I'll bet he's a little angel. <laughs> Do angels wear clothes, Daddy? Oh, no. Then where did they put the handkerchief? Now, what kind of a question is that, Snooks? I think it's all right. <laughs> Handkerchiefs. Angels are very beautiful. Remember that little poem I taught you? I want to be an angel, and with the angels stand. A crown upon my forehead, a harp within my hand. That's beautiful. Don't you want to be an angel and fly with wings? I want to be a monkey and swing on my tail. Now, that's enough. <laughs> Come on, now. Off with your clothes and hop right into bed. No, I don't want to go to bed. Now, don't start any nonsense. <laughs> you can yell all you like. I'm leaving. If you go, I'll choke myself till my head falls off. Now, listen, Snooks, please go to bed like a good girl. I've got to stop for a shave, and the barbershop closes in ten minutes. I want to get a haircut. You want a haircut? Yeah, like Uncle Louie with a hole in the top. <laughs> well, you stop this idiotic stalling. I've got to get out of here. <laughs> now, Snooks, Mother's waiting up for me at the hospital. Come on, tell me a story. Oh, all right, but a quick one. Now, which one do you want? Uh, Goldilocks and Cinderella and Jack and the Beanstalk. No, you can only hear one of those three. Now, which one? Little Red Riding Hood. All right. But no interruptions. And you'll be undressing in the meantime. All right, Daddy. All right. Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Little Red Riding Hood. Her mother told Who's her to... mother? Red Riding Hood. She told her to... No, uh... her mother? No, her mother told her. So she who? told her to... Red Riding Hood! Ah. Now, if you interrupt me once more, I'll leave. <laughs> her mother told her to take a basket of food to her grandmother, who was very ill and to be careful not to stop and talk to anybody in the forest, especially wolves. And then uh, something happened, and then something else. Anyway, it doesn't matter. When she finally got in the cabin, instead of her grandmother, she found somebody else in the bed who was very ugly and had shaggy hair, horrible teeth, and a mean, vicious look. Do you know who that was? Uncle Louie. Good boy. <laughs> And now, Ted Turton, your turn. Well, Bob, let me ask you something. Did you know that many more people are now drinking Maxwell House coffee than at any time in its history? No, I can't say that I did, Ted, but I'm not surprised. It strikes me that a thing like that doesn't just happen. What's the answer, Ted? Well, it's really very simple, Bob. Maxwell House coffee is now even richer in flavor and body than ever before. And it doesn't take people long to discover this better value. And when they do, they tell their friends. That, in a nutshell, is why more people are drinking Maxwell House now than ever before. Well, then it looks as though the people who haven't tried Maxwell House lately are really missing something. They really are, Bob. For Maxwell House coffee has been improved in two important ways. First, improved in blend. 
This already superb blend of the world's choice coffees has now been further enriched. You'll notice an extra smoothness and mellowness in this new Maxwell House. It's got a deep, full-bodied goodness that'll satisfy you, we believe, beyond any coffee you've ever tasted. Second, it's improved in roast. This enriched Maxwell House blend is now roasted by a new process called radiant roast. Now, radiant heat penetrates each coffee bean, gives it not just a surface roasting, but roasts it evenly clear through. Now, this means still more full flavor in your morning cup of coffee. So to you who haven't tried Maxwell House coffee lately, let me suggest, get the new Maxwell House tomorrow. Discover for yourself why more people than ever are now agreeing that Maxwell House is the coffee that's good to the last drop. Meredith Wilson presents now an unusual musical composition, Deep Purple. It was written by Peter DeRose and has steadily increased in popularity since his first presentation several years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, Deep Purple. composition, 
And a deep purple orchid to you, Meredith, for a great performance. And ladies and gentlemen, I would also like to salute a person that made my stay in England extremely pleasant when we made a yank at Oxford. Mr. Ben Getz, Managing Director of metro Golden mayer British Studios. Mr. Getz brought with him from England the completed picture of the year's outstanding novel, The Citadel, starring Robert Donat and Rosalind Russell. Hollywood is looking forward with excitement to the preview of The Citadel. Good luck, Ben. You know, Ted, I guess nearly all our listeners know what to expect along about this halfway point in our proceedings. It's time for that pleasant custom of ours. Yes, sir, time for a moment of relaxation over a steaming, fragrant cup of Maxwell House coffee. And what truly fresh coffee it is, too. Maxwell House is packed, still fresh and fragrant, in that airtight super vacuum can. So it comes to you with all its tempting flavor and goodness sealed in. You get it, not just days fresh, but roaster fresh. So let's all enjoy a friendly cup together right here and now. We're all ready, Ted, and I'm going to ask Meredith here to give us the music that goes with it. We now pause briefly for station identification. Now, from the field of sports, or rather formally from the field of sports, we bring you a man who, after 17 years as a prize fighter, has suddenly blossomed out as Hollywood's number one glamour man, and is currently appearing in the Warner Brothers picture, Women in the Wind. In this corner, the ex-light heavyweight champion of the world and present holder of the California heavyweight title, Slapsy Maxi Rosenblum. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, including you to Bob. <laughs> I'm certainly glad to be here on such a suspicious occasion. And I want to do good because some of my most ignorant friends are listening in. <laughs> We're happy to have you with us, Maxie. A mere bag of tell, Bob. Yeah. Tired as I am from a very strenuous day in front of the creek lights, your kind words make my heart soar to the heights of idiosyncrasies. <laughs> and I thank you again. Uh, Max, look, this radio match was promoted so we could corner you into an interview. What do you say we start slugging questions? Ask me anything, chump. Yes. Well, uh, Maxie, now that you've become quite a film star, is it true that you're giving up fighting entirely? Bob, I'll tell you. And I say this in all theoretical. <laughs> the studios do take up a great deal of my time, but fisticuffs are not entirely overlooked in my daily dilly-dallying. Uh, yeah, you, you, you still keep in training, huh? I was training last night at the Trocadero. Say, why should I mention that place? I got a cafe of my own I ought to plug. Yeah, that's right. It's called Slapsy Maxie's. How's the cafe doing, Max? I'm very happy to say that business is exceptionally helter skelter. <laughs> and we can't this to the most extinguished people. Yes, I, I understand it's very high class. <laughs> it's better than high class. Why, last week we raised the cover charge to 15 cents just to keep out the riffraff. Yeah, well, that, uh, that should do it, Maxie. Of course, once in a while, you get a noisy snipe. What happened last night? Well, we was right in the middle of our big floor show, Extravaganza, when in comes one of the most annoying individuals we've ever had in our joint, uh, Rendezvous. The guy was strictly a loudmouth hoodlum. A real rowdy, huh? Rowdy? Well, that guy got me so illuminated that I was going to suck him right in the kisser. But you can't do them things in a high class place like mine. No, 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 of course not. Well, what, what did you do? Oh, nothing. I just blacked his eyes, kicked him in the teeth, and threw him out on his head. It's a lie. I walked out like a perfect gentleman. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, where am I? Oh, Bob, it's, it's you. I, uh, I guess I'm a little flustered. Must have been dozing or something. Well, uh, what can you expect from a man who just lost a fortune overnight? Lost a fortune overnight? Frank, what are you talking about? Well, I went to sleep feeling like a million dollars and woke up feeling like two cents. <laughs> That's one of the bon mots I use in my Morgan for Senator campaign speeches. You know how the people are, Bob. They like their senators with a sparkle of wit. Yes, in your case, Frank, they're half right. <laughs> what? I can think of seven very nauseating comebacks to that remark, but I'll need your vote in the coming election. Uh, Frank, do you know Maxie Rosenblum? That unscrupulous politician? Bob, he hasn't a chance against me. The people know that Morgan is their man for senator, and when I'm elected, I'll well, Frank, tell them... Frank, 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 that... this is Rosenblum right here. Maxie yes. Rosenblum, the former world's light heavyweight champion. Yes, well, I don't care if he's the... the, the what? <laughs> uh... Oh, uh, Maxie, <laughs> Rosenblum, uh, of course. Well, I'm glad to know you, Mr. Rosenblum. The feeling is vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so you're a pugilist, eh, my good man? Quite so, if you must be irrelevant. 
Ah, the mere mention of the prize ring and how my thoughts rush back to those good old days when I, too, was an outstanding exponent of the manly art of self-defense. Mr. Morgan, you'll have to excuse a man of my intelligence for not knowing nothing. But I never heard about you being a prize fighter. Small wonder, my boy. That was in the dear, dim past, the golden era. I suppose you must have battled the old Madison Square Garden. Years ago, when it was known as the old Madison Round Garden and the scene of some of my most terrific ring encounters. I'll never forget my last fight there. A 57-round bout to a finish. The Marquis of Queensbury rules, bare fists, knuckles down, and no fudging. My opponent was knockout Hogan. Poor fellow, in that fight, he went berserk. Lost his mind completely. What happened? Too many punches in the head? No, but in those days, we fought in a circular ring, and he went crazy looking for his corner. <laughs> uh, yes, well, I gave up the fight game after that, and then, after many varied careers, became an actor. Now as a crowning achievement to my meteoric existence, now as a crowning achievement to my meteoric existence, I have thrown my hat in the senatorial ring. Do you really think the people in the pools will allocate you for senator? <laughs> Most decidedly, Mr. Rosenblum, and I sincerely trust that I can count on you to cast your vote for senator in favor of the people's friend, Frankie Morgan. Fearless, dependable, honest, and with unquestioned integrity, I wear no man's collar. Have a cigar. Any babies to kiss? They must be over 18. <laughs> oh, I'll vote for you, if you'll do me a favor. Don't worry, my good man. I'll find you a nice, soft political job. Maybe head chicken inspector or the like, eh? <laughs> no, that's anyone I mean. No? You see, I can't give up the fight racket to devote my, mostly my time being a matinee idol. Oh. And you can see that I kind of help out an awful lot, but I can have big words. After all, I got my cinema career to think about, and you, being a fine actor of ill repute, you can help me. <laughs> You've come to the right man, Mr. Rosenblum. The theater boasts of no more distinguished alumni than the Morgans. My great-great-grandfather, John Wilkes Morgan, was the original Hamlet. Yeah, and his great-great-grandson, Frank Morgan, is the original Ham. <laughs> yes, an uncalled-for remark from the sidelines, my tepid-tongued young master of morose laryngeal liquidation. You see, that's what I mean. I want to be able to kick them big words around like you. Yeah? Not only for the sake of the Academy Awards, but when them dings and debut champs come into my cafe... <laughs> I've got to know just how to talk to him. Yes, well, I'll be only too glad to lend my assistance to your grammatical edification. Try this bit of a stanza as a sort of a starter. Coruscate, coruscate, diminutive stellar orb. How inexplicable to this baffled individual seems the stupendous perplexity of your existence. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder where you are. Come on, Mr. Rosenblum, give it a try. Coruscate, coruscate, coruscate. The minute the smell of orb... No, no, I've got you... <laughs> You see, it just goes to show you. Yeah. Some fiction lessons I've been taking ain't doing me a bit of good. Well, to tell you the truth, my good man, I don't really think that any amount of pedagogics could ever penetrate the excessive fat tissues surrounding the anterior section of your anatomy. Now, that I don't like. What? <laughs> if it means what I think it does, I'll smack you right in the nose. Well, never let it be said that a Morgan shirked a challenge. Here, just knock this chip off my shoulder. You mean your head? <laughs> Well, that's the camel that breaks the elephant's back. Bob, Bob Taylor. What's the matter, Frank? Well, I choose you for my second. I've been challenged to a fistic encounter with Mr. Rosenblum, and I accept. You accept? What's yes. the matter with you, Frank? Did you forget that Rosenblum here used to be a world champion? I don't. It doesn't matter. But what? Oh, uh, yes, champion. Uh, well, I... Oh, uh, no. Well, no. Uh, not too late to see you back. Maybe this piece of lesson will stop bragging. Well, I don't, uh, <laughs> You come, uh, uh, well, all right. Just here, hold my vest, my tie, and here's my shirt. Now I'm ready. Hey, hey, wait a minute, Morgan. What? If you're going to fight me, what are you going that way for? I'm well, over here. Well, who's going to fight? I'm going out for a sun bath. So long. <laughs> well, uh, Maxie, it was swell of you to drop in and say it. It was very delicious of you to ask me, Bob. <laughs> I guess now I'd better scram, huh? The time allotted me has perspired. <laughs> I read that on my insurance policy. Yeah, well, Maxie, look, if you don't have to rush away, why don't you stick around and meet the rest of the gang? Sure, I'll do that. Thanks, Don. Unquote. <laughs> Phil Regan returns with another song. This time, it's one of those Irish ballads he does so well. A Little Bit of Heaven. Have you ever heard the story of how Ireland got its name? I'll tell you so you'll understand from whence all Ireland came. 
No wonder that we're proud of that dear land across the sea. For years away, me dear old mother, all the tale to me. You're a little bit of heaven, sir. From out the sky one day, and nestled in the ocean is a spot so far away. And when the angels found it, sure it looked so sweet and fair. They said, suppose we leave it, for it looked so peaceful then. So they sprinkled it with stardust dust to make the shamrock glow. Is the only place you will find them, no matter where you go. Then they dotted it with silver to make its lake so grand. And when they had it finished, sure they called. Nice work, Phil. Nice work. Thank you, Bob. Hey, uh, hey uh, Bob. Yes, Mattis. Did you fix up that little difficulty, you know, that I had with Miss Wright? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I just told you you were a nice fellow who meant well, only you didn't have enough sense to come in out of the ring. You did? Oh, yes. gee, thanks, Bob. That's wonderful. You're welcome, Mattis. Anyhow, Miss Rice is now going to appear in a fantasy, especially written for this program. Florence, will you make your formal entrance now? This is it, Bob. Hello. Oh, go away. Go away, Meredith. And Ted Pearson, will you set the scene for us, please? Why, well, sure, Bob. Robert Taylor plays Bill, and Florence Rice plays Anne in Literary Gem, a whimsical sketch written by George Beck. The scene is the book line study of Jeff Larrabee, widely published author, who could be great if only he had something to say. Well, at the moment, as he has been doing for the past three hours, Jeff, played by Hanley Stafford, is staring vacantly at the almost blank page. Uh, 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 I've got to get this story finished tonight, and I can't even get started. Uh. Yes? Oh, oh, sure, Mr. Pendleton. Going great guns. You'll have the story at ten sharp. Sure, it's the greatest story I ever wrote. A literary gem. What are you worried about? Yep, I've got everything I need. Goodbye. Uh, everything I need except an idea. Now, where am I? Still behind the eight ball. Uh, 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 uh. Uh. But it will always be like this, darling, Anne said dreamily. Bill clutched her and embraced her fiercely. Oh, nuts. You said it. Huh? Uh, what? How do you dare write anything like that? Say, who, who the devil are you? It's us, Anne and Bill. Anne and Bill? Anne and Bill who? Where? Here, here on the page in your typewriter. Page? Hey. Oh. See here, Larrabee. How, I've had enough of this. How long do I stay a dope? Oh, you're Bill, the hero of this story. Hero? That's nice. I'm the hero, he says. Excuse me, I didn't know. For the past six installments of this hunk of so-called literature, I've been the most nauseating caricature of a heel. And that... I've been queen of the maze. You mean you, you don't like what you are? No. Do you? Well, frankly, since you asked me, I, I think you're without doubt the most horrible pair of... of, of Even of, he uh... can't think of a word for us. Come right out with it, Larrabee. Don't mind Anne's pink shell like it. Whatever we are, you wrote us, you know. Why don't you let me make a pass at Anne? One pass, just once, with a bundle of fingers. All the time you got me inhaling her hair. Why can't I be a real hero, the kind of hero readers applaud? Why, well, why, where do you get off telling me what her eyes? Simple enough. All you got to do is write so Bill hauled off and socked her smack on her Cupid's bow mouth. Sock me, huh? I'll bite his ears off the next time you have him kiss me. I can't stand him, I tell you. Look at him. Just look at him. That's a hero. Pooey. Will you listen to her? Does that sound like a heroine of yours, Larrabee? Certainly not. I never heard such talk. Heroin, my foot. 
I want to be a gun mall or something. At least give me something to do. You hear that? She said gimme and want it. Yes, now what's your diction, Anne? All my heroines are ladies. I don't want to be no lady. I want to be a dame from Brooklyn. Hiya, babe. How'd you do? You've got me sitting in scented balls, so it's a wonder I haven't dissolved. Now, there's a cheering thought. Oh, shut up, the two of you. I'm writing this. I guess I know what the public wants. Oh, you don't even know what time it is. I know what let's do, Bill. Let's strike. Strike. That's it. Sit down, Anne. Now, now, look here. Now, stand up, you two. I've got to get this story out tonight. If I don't come through, I- I'm washed up. They're holding the presses waiting for mm, me. With bated breath, I suppose. Hey, do you know something? I'm going to marry the villain. What? Why, you can't. Impossible. Oh, I don't know. Want to bet? Pity the poor villain. That's all I need. My heroine marrying the villain. Why, it's, it's sacrilege. Unheard of. Mm, unheard of in your stuff, maybe. Now, if you wrote realism, got some, some yumps into you. I don't write realism. I, I'm romantic life. Mm, and sweet. A flyweight. Yeah, has been, if you ask me. Oh, is that so? Well, nobody asked you. Just for that, I'll fix you. Now, uh, here, what do you mean? Ha <laughs> ha! You'll find out when you're married. When you're living happily forever after. With the twins. Married? Twins? Oh, not me, you don't. Why should I marry her? Literary form demands it. The story's got to end in I Love You. With him? Oh, what a horrible fate. Oh, maybe you think you're some hunk of stuff. Now, 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 there's a little number in the first installment, that redhead, Missy. Remember her, Larry? If it was her you wanted me to marry. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Oh, I don't think she's so hot. Yeah, don't you wish you were like her, though? A redhead and muscle-bound. Is that so? Well, at least she's got more to offer than sweet-scented hair in the moonlight. She swims and skis, does everything. I don't doubt it. Yeah, I like a girl who can do more than just sit and languish. Well, I could ski, too, if this, this two-fingered hack would only put me on a pair of them. Oh, well, no, I don't like snow. Besides, you're not the athletic type, you're willing. Oh, that's the trouble with them. I want to be different. So, I'm going to marry the villain. Oh, I'd never get away with it. The editors would throw you right in the basket. Who to you? And who to the editors? What this story needs is a twist. Something that'll curl their hair. A, a, a scandal, maybe. Scandal? Hey, you've got something there. Of course, now, I can't get you involved, but there's Bill. Sure, that's it. We'll involve Bill in a scandal. Nothing doing. Why must he have all the fun? You mean with someone else, some other dame? With my idea, I guess I can get into a scandal if I want to. Let's see now. Who can we get? What about Mitzi? Mm-hmm. I could bring her back. Sure, it's a cinch. Now, what do we do? How do I get involved? Mitzi. <laughs> Your taste is all in your mouth. Oh, the usual thing. Clandestine meeting. You make love to her and so on, so on, so on, so on. Brilliant, so on, so on. brilliant. Will you just listen to this genius? And then Anne raises the devil. Not see? me. I wouldn't raise a finger for him. Now, wouldn't it be a darn sight more interesting if I got involved with that Ricky, you know, the villain? Oh, no, 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 oh, no. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Why can't I? Now, there's a man. Oh, that one time you let him lure me through my apartment, oh. The old etchings gag, huh? Well, what about it? You never lured me anywhere, not even onto a porch swing. And you haven't got an etching, you haven't even got a tattoo. Now, don't be difficult, Anne. You're the heroine, you, you're above reproach. Like Caesar's wife. Oh, she never had any fun either. Hey, Larrabee, I see the whole thing. Hmm? I'm a playboy, see? Plenty of dough, a big penthouse on Park Avenue, all the trim. Oh, and money, too. He gets everything. Eh, it's about time I got a break. Uh, now, where were we? Uh, oh, yeah, so I'm a lounge lizard in cafe society. So I... A bum. And what a bum. So I, I meet this Mitzi again at a bar. Yeah, bar. Uh, like, like this. Now, why can't I meet Ricky at a bar? Uh, Larrabee, heroin at a bar. Don't be silly. No, no, it won't do, Bill. You've got the wrong angle. Ah, what do you know about it? Well, we've got to be subtle, and, and let's keep liquor out of it. Subtle? You? I've got it. Hold everything. It's on a yacht. You meet the girl, a weekend cruise, and so on, so on, so on, so on. So she falls overboard, she's drowned. Good. Bill dives in and rescues her. Oh, now, wait a minute. I get all wet. You always were all wet. Now, go away, both of you. No time for your bickering. Right there, long time for Oh, dear, come on, Bill. He's already forgotten it. No, I'd better stick around. See, he does right by me. You can't trust these authors, you know. Uh, say, Anne. Yes, Bill? You didn't mean it really about that Ricky the villain, did you? Mm, no, but he really is sweet. Yeah, I suppose so. I didn't mean a word about that redhead Mitzi, either. What's more, I don't even like her. Oh, I dare say she's very nice. Yeah, but yeah, she giggles. <laughs> oh, Anne, if you'd, if you'd give me half a chance, I... What I mean is, well, how about marrying me? What? <laughs> oh, Bill, this is so... Now, 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 now don't, don't you dare say this is so sudden. No, it's so funny. Huh? Oh, I beg your pardon. Oh, wait, I don't mean what you think, Bill. I mean... <laughs> well, I'm glad you're amused. Bye. Wait, Bill, I didn't mean anything. All I meant was that... Well, look, here we are, winding up the way Larrabee intended for us to all along. Don't you see how funny that is? <laughs> so, say it is funny. <laughs> <laughs> he does know what he's doing after all. Boy, what a 
Hey, Anne, Anne, let's jump right into the typewriter. Uh-huh. Here we go. One, One two, two. Hey, wait. How does this thing end? We're going to get married, you dope. And if you're a smart author, yes. you'll see that we have a little sequel. Oh, now why didn't I think of that? <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Take a bow, Florence. Thank you, Bob. And here's a little musical item for the Jitterbugs, a new song written by the King of Swing himself, Benny Goodman's Lullaby in Rhythm. told that today nearly one out of every three women are making coffee by the drip method. That is, these women are using drip pots or glass coffee makers to prepare their coffee. Well, here's a bit of advice for all of them. If you want to make the best cup of coffee by the drip method, be sure to use a coffee ground especially for this method. The new Maxwell House in the special drip grind is just right for drip pots and glass coffee makers. With it, you'll get a better cup of coffee every single time. And that's a very wise suggestion. For the special Drip Grind Maxwell House is ground especially for glass coffee makers and drip pots. You see, when you make drip coffee correctly, the water passes through the coffee only once. Now, this means the coffee you use for the drip method must be uniformly ground to just the exact fineness, so that all the full flavor and goodness of the coffee is extracted quickly. Now, that's why Maxwell House, after scientific study of all ways of making drip coffee, offers you a special drip grind. To make a sparkling, really clear cup of drip coffee every time, buy this special drip grind Maxwell House. And by the same token, to get the most delicious coffee by the percolator or boiled method, buy the regular grind Maxwell House. So you'll find this superb new coffee now at all grocers in the same familiar super vacuum blue can you've always known. And remember, Maxwell House is selling at low prices friendly to your budget. So now more than ever is the time to make friends with Maxwell House. For the first time in a long while, we're going to take you to the little dressing room in a corner of stage 30. The name on the door says Fanny Bryce, and inside, with her maid, Musette, we find Fanny humming gaily to herself. Flat foot food, you eat the flat foot, flat foot, flat foot. Oh, Musette, see, open the door, let's in our good-looking gentleman. But how do you know it is a good-looking gentleman? If he ain't, don't open the door. Hello, Fanny. Don't let me disturb you if you're decomposed. <laughs> well, looky, 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 if it ain't my old pal, the velvety, schlepsy, mexy. Haven't you met you in this park? I was just visiting the studio here and hobnobbling with some of my old crows, so I thought I'd drop in a chair for a minute. Come in, sit down, relax yourself. I knew that this was your dressing room right away, Fanny. When I walked by, I could hear you singing. You like this? It's the most beautiful asthma I ever heard. Thank you. <laughs> Say, Maxi, is this true what I'm hearing? That you gave up the fight racket and now you're acting as a skipping flicker? <laughs> Quite so. I'm demoting in front of the cameras now. With muscles like yours, you should be at least a Tarzan. Yeah, Tarzan would be a very tranquility part for me. I'd be good swinging from them trees. I got big, strong arms. Here, just feel them. Mmm, like I am exactly. It's a pleasure. 
He's so charmed in the love scenes you would be a killer dealer. You know something? What? You are killed to me. Can I, I help it if my appeal is so obnoxious? I don't know why they give me them dopey parts. You can see that I'm strictly the great lover type. Absolutely. Maybe you're looking for a little practice. Yeah. I'd like to play one of them parts where I'm the beautiful... Excuse me. I'm the hero that saves the beautiful damsel in distress. It's not a coincidental. It so happens that I got here a scene for my next picture with a part for you that positively hits the nail on the button. Do you mind if I ask you to rehearse with me a few lines? Pray do. <laughs> Now, you play the part of G-Man McTracy, and I play the part of our ravishing, beautiful lady crook, Nimble Finger Nancy. <laughs> Go ahead, read the first line. <clears throat> so it's you, Nimble Fingers Nancy. Ah, so it's you, G-Man McTracy. Ah, so I catch you shoplifting, eh? Eh, hey, so you catch me shoplifting, ah. <laughs> Aha, so you're stealing some underwear. I'm a sofa, so it's my first sleep. <laughs> Why don't you give up this life of crime, gal? You know, I've always loved you. Why should you be a dirty crook and steal like a thief? Marry me or let me do those things for you. Ah, uh, he loves me. But what do you know about love? <laughs> I drove a taxi for two years. <laughs> okay, kid, I'll marry you on one condition. If you'll get my brother a job. He's a midget. I'll get him a job as a milk man with a condensed milk company. Then take me in your arms, my flat foot Romeo, and hold me tight like a clam. Go ahead, take me in your arms. How? How, yes. Look, make off like I'm another fighter, and you was in the clincher. There, you're in my arms. How's that? Hmm, fighters should cling much closer. <laughs> there, you're in my arms. Can I kiss you now? Mm -hmm. I said you're in my arms. Can I kiss you now? Mm -hmm. What's the matter, you deaf? What's the matter, you paralyzed? <laughs> Okay, sister, you asked for it. Oh. Oh. Do you mind returning, please, my lower lip? Now you're going to be my blush and bride, gal. I'll love you forever. Oh, you're just saying that because I'm young and my hair is golden. But what will you say when I'm old and gray? I owe silver. For the concert hall tonight, Meredith Wilson has chosen a melody that is popular everywhere music is played. The opera Cavalleria Rusticana was an instantaneous success when it was first presented, and its composer, Mascagni, is still remembered for this opera alone. Meredith presents the intermezzo from Cavalleria Rusticana.
friends, here's real good news for our show next Thursday night. Our guest star, the one and only Spencer Tracy, whose picture, Boys Town, is America's number one hit. Spencer will appear in a powerful, dramatic playlist. He will also meet Fanny Bryce and be present in another one of our popular satires if men attended fashion shows as women do. You say further, Mr. Pearson. Right, Mr. Taylor. Friends, another usual item. We will present Dick Rawson and Clyde Devina, who braved the perils of the Dutch Guiana jungle, where they filmed scenes for Clark Gable and Myrna Loy's picture sensation, Too Hot to Handle. And incidentally, I saw Too Hot to Handle, and it's real dynamite. Don't miss it. In addition, Francis Wallace, nationally known author and football authority, whose annual pigskin preview is published currently in the Saturday Evening Post, will give his football predictions of the games played the following Saturday. Now, these special features will be in addition to our regular cast of favorites, Frank Morgan, Fanny Bryce, Hanley Stafford, Phil Regan, Meredith Wilson and his orchestra. I know you won't want to miss next Thursday's show, but in the meantime, go to the movies and take the family with you. And remember, when you attend your favorite moving picture theater, be sure you secure your copy of the $250,000 contest booklet. Remember, too, this is Motion Picture's greatest year. I'll see you in the movies. Thank you and good night. Frank Morgan has asked me to tell you that his campaign song, Morgan for Senator, was written by Roger Edens of the Metro Music Staff. And folks, don't forget that next week, many communities go back to standard time. So good news of 1939 will be heard next Thursday at 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, 8 o'clock Central Standard Time, 7 o'clock Mountain Standard Time, and 6 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. So until next Thursday, this is Ted Pearson saying good night and good luck for the makers of Maxwell House. The coffee that's always good to the last drop. This is the National Broadcasting Company.